riding down Highway 61 Sides of the roads all lined with fields Nothing but sunset in the windshield Feel it as soon as I ride into town This is where I go to slow Beans and corn, I'm in the place where the blues was born. About a mile from the big muddy river, place I'll always remember. Cabin on the lake and a fishing pole. Forever here, I'll rest my soul. I can feel my worries drift away. What's up, guys? Brad Chapel back. I'm at the Crappie Compound in Como, Mississippi, with two legends of the sport. On my left, Mr. Steve Coleman. Yep. On my right, Ken Driscoll. Hey, hey. You know, I got a really good topic today that I wanted to get these guys included in. And, you know, it's something that everybody can do, and it actually helps the fisheries. And it actually helps you catch more fish. Absolutely. It's making your own honey hole. And I thought about this topic today and I was like, man, I know Steve Coleman has put out literally probably thousands of piles in these different lakes. Oh, he was known I, to do it now. I've built enough to build houses. Houses. <laughs> yeah. And I know Kent does it as well up there where he's at. Yeah. I tell you, since uh, I moved to Nashville, I learned real quick. If you're going to catch crappie around Percy Priest Lake, you better have some structure. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Barnes, the more I've really got into live scope and I've started to really cast into these brush piles, I really realized how much I have missed through the years by not really focusing on structure. Like I used to just really pull and pull crankbaits for, you know, crappie even during the summertime and such. But, man, these brush piles in the summertime, you can make your own honey hole. I absolutely, you know, all these crappie are sunfish anyway, so they, you know, they like to hide. Yeah. You know, they like to get in the shadows, so uh, making crappie condos is, uh, is the name of the game. I want to uh, pick both of you guys' brain a little bit and kind of give the, somebody that wants to get out there on their home lake, and as long as you need to check with your regulations, you make do. sure it's legal. That's right. Uh, like on the Ross Barnett, you need to have a permit. So check with your local fisheries department to make sure it's actually legal to do but after you get the go ahead on that what are some of the best ways that somebody can get on the lake and attract fish and create a crappie fish and honey hole well you know just for your local person you know everybody at christmas time most of them have christmas trees yeah you know they'll last you two or three years but after that they'll kind of rot away but uh, any kind of structure you know yard structure hedges uh trimmings of trees anything that a crappie can hide in you know um you know, we kind of go to the extremes when we build crappie beds, you know. It's, we build a stake bed, we put in whole trees, you know. It's, you know, we've got a barge that we haul trees on, you know. So, so um, and when you put them in that lake, you know, it's it's everybody's beds then, you know. Yeah. They belong to everyone. But um, building that structure is the key to having those fish uh, grow up to old age, you know. You know, I was told and heard rumors of years past that, you and Rodney would go to these lakes and sink structure months in advance. Oh, we do it years in advance. Yeah, yeah. You still got some of those locations and oh, that I, you go back to every time you hit these lakes? I've got thousands of them, yeah. On every lake that I can think of I've ever fished. If you guys, and each one of you can answer this, but if each one of you had to pick one particular ideal structure to put out, and I'm talking width and wood type, leaves or non-leaves, I want to hear what would your honey hole secret success be made of? Well, mine would be uh, probably about a 20-inch white oak or a beech tree. You know, that's, that's a huge tree. That's a tree. big tree. And it takes a lot of work to get get it where you want it, you know. But it's uh, we've got some that's 20, 25 years old. You know, you never have to replace them. Uh, leave the big limbs on them where the trunk can stand off the bottom. You know, we've been down on the water diving on these trees, and you can crawl under them, you know. <laughs> They're standing off the bottom. And um, Pickwick, for example, 
you ever see someone who got a pickwick? Really? You know, we've told some of the bass fishermen about these trees. They won't listen to you. I mean, they're full of smallmouth. I'm talking about big ones. You can't even catch a crop in there because they're so yeah. big bass that's in them. I mean. Now, just, you got the 20-inch base. Or bigger. Or bigger. How high would it be? Yeah, we got a lot of stuff that's like in 30 foot of water, you know, but those trees come within 10 foot to the surface. So they've got they've got they've got a lot, lot of places to live down through there so leaves or non-leaves well if you, you know if you put them out with leaves on them um you know the sap's still in the tree right and uh, any type of oak or hardwood really you don't have to weight it down just sink it then you know once it hits the bottom settles in for the summer it's going to be there so it's you it doesn't take quite as much weight to anchor them down in the summertime if they're full of leaves and got the sap in right right they're gonna, just, they're gonna sink anyway right unless you've got a current like river river current yeah you probably need to put weights on there what would be the ideal location in a regular reservoir for you to go out there and drop one of these pieces of structure mm, deep water muddy bottom deep water muddy bottom why is that i don't know those those big gills they like it they like that cool mud in the summertime that's where they rest at in that cool mud do you try to have them high enough that the typical thermocline sets up right above right them right they can get above that they can all right, Ken, I'm going to hear your honey hole now. Yeah, so uh, I agree with a lot of what Steve's saying. Yeah. Um, if I had to pick one type of tree, it would probably be a green sycamore. And for the same reason, they're full of sap. They sink. Um, when the leaves are on them, they silt in, and, and you don't have to weigh them down unless there's a lot of current. I also like a hardwood that's already been in the water. So if I can find a tree that's already got a lot of... Uh, you know, moss on it, and it's already waterlogged, so to speak. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll 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 drag those off the bank because they they wash up, and a lot of those trees have a root ball on them. Right. And in my opinion, man, the root ball is key. Okay. And one of the things that I do um, is when I put this structure out, is I name my structure. Yeah. So I know what it is. So if it's a sycamore, I put sycamore. If it's an oak, I put oak. All right. I also like to position my trees based on the sun okay where i know i'm That's gonna have new. yeah because most of my fishing is in the, in the morning time you know and i know the sun's coming up in the east and a lot of times i'll position where that root ball will be you know uh kicking that shadow kicking that shadow and kicking that shade hmm. and uh i don't particularly like to stand them up i like to lay them down parallel myself that's my my personal opinion so if i do weight them down um what i like to do there is i'll take about a 15 foot piece of rope and uh and I'll take a five-gallon bucket, and I'll fill that five-gallon bucket full of concrete with the rope already in it. And, I'll, and uh, I'll, you know, I'll tie a knot or a brick in that rope to where, you know, it'll stay in that bucket. And then, you know, those buckets, when you got a plastic bucket, it's a lot easier to move it around in your boat. Yeah. You can kind of roll it around a little bit, and then you can get it on the edge of the, of the boat, tie it to your tree, and then just pitch it over in the water. And when you have a little bit of line between your bucket and the tree, then it has a tendency to suspend that tree like Steve was talking about. And you got a canopy so they can actually get underneath it as well. And, uh, you know, the crappie absolutely love, you know, structure. They hide, you know, they rest there, they live there. And a lot Spawn of these, there. Yeah, a lot of them do. Like on Priest, for example, it's a clear water lake. And I think Pickwick's kind of the same way. A it lot is. of those fish mm -hmm. will spawn out deep. I kind of like a 20 to 22, you know, 20, maybe 24 max on depth range. That's kind of my, my range I like. Because also I got to keep in mind that they draw the lake down 10 feet in the winter and I don't want people to see them sticking <laughs> right. out of the water. Because when they stick out of the water, they rot faster. That's right. Okay. And then we've got a lot of pleasure boaters and stuff like that too. And those guys have a tendency to, you know, to, to anchor up their big boats with these electric anchors and they'll, you know, from time to time they pull them up or, yeah. you know, tear them yeah. up or something like that. So that's kind of my favorite, but I also do buckets and stake beds too. And uh, I'll, I'll build, uh, I'll take five gallon buckets and put, I'll put a dozen, you know, six to eight foot uh, oak stakes in them. I'll cement them in there. And then a lot of times I take a small tree and I tie it in the top of the bucket. And those are really easy to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I might pull up on a spot and put like three of them out at one time, kind of in a triangle. And, uh, you know, and again, I name them. And that way I know, you know, what they are. And like, you know, if we're fishing a tournament or something like that, and. And, I, and I'm working on like a pattern and I know the fish are on stakes, then I can bounce from stake bed to stake bed to stake bed looking at my GPS and not, and, and move over the brush piles. Yeah, eliminate and, the Yeah, stuff. instead of just putting, you know, because I'm like Steve, I, I've got 2,000 brush piles or GPS waypoints on Priest. 
Wow. And that's stuff I put out plus what I found. Yeah. And uh, so anyways, but I do take the time. When I find them, though, I also take the time to rename them, you know, or name them. You know, if it's a yeah. new brush pile or a new stake bed. And, uh, you know, so that's kind of my, you know, my secret, um, you know, to keeping up with it, managing it. And uh, the thing about it is you'll put out for every 10 you put out, you get two or three really good ones. And then you're going right. to get some me mediocre ones and the other ones sometimes don't produce. So it's kind of the risk you take. So I also, uh, I try to put them in what I consider high, you know, highly productive areas. And I, I like being close to some kind of drop off most of the time. I, I want to be close. Some kind of ledge. Yeah. yeah, some type of ledge for the most part. I, 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 you know, sometimes I put them right on the ledge, but a lot of times I put them off the ledge on a flat, maybe, you know, in, in, in maybe 50 feet off the edge of the, the actual drop off itself. Because uh, I know those fish are going to travel up down that ledge on the seasonal migrations. And uh, it's kind of an art to it. And I don't think every lake is the same. Yeah. So once you figure out something that works on your local lake, you need to start repeating that. And uh, I, there's a guy on Priest, his name's Dude Maddox and, and Brian Oldham. And they build these, they call them a condos, okay? And they're these giant, and if you've ever fished that lake, you'll know what I'm talking about. But they're like a four by four frame of oak stakes. And then they V them off at a V and then they'll lay a tree in the top of them. And they're very, when you see one on a live scope, you know exactly who put that out there. They're the only guys that do that. Huh. And I found a lot of their stuff. And you know, I've actually put out like a brush pile and look 50 feet to the left and there's one of theirs. <laughs> yeah. But you know, and it's like Steve said, um, once you put them in the lake, that you know, it's not yours, you know, right. you put them out there, but everybody can fish them. It's public water. It's, it's public, public water. water. Yeah. So it's just, you know, that's one of the, uh, one of the things you just got to accept and, and, uh, you know, but there's a lot of guys doing it, you know, it's enhancing the fishery. Well, that's what was kind of my next point. I was going to ask you guys, what would be some of the benefits as far as the fishery goes? You know, we want to put them out there to make our own honey holes, but you know, if you got a lake that you might feel that it's hurt a little mm -hmm. bit, what would be some of the structures that you could add to it and to say, you know what, this is going to help them during the spawn or help the fry to survive. Do you ever kind of look at that kind of scenarios and say, Hey, you know what? I, I might not catch fish on it as far as being a my honey hole, but I think this piece of structure while I'm out here, I'm gonna throw it on in there and hopefully. Right. Would you ever looked at that kind of thing or? Well, you know, at, uh, any type of structure that's real thick, just like what you said, the fry. Yeah. You know, you got to protect those fry, and there's a lot of the structure that we have that you can go to it and it's fry all over. Then there's structures. You'll see you schools of fry. Right. Yeah. I mean, real thick. Then you go to like some of our steak beds. Won't be any fry in it, but it'll have four or five big fish in it. You know. Um, so the fry, they they like the real thick new stuff, really. What about black crappie versus white crappie? If you fished, uh, if you're going to a lake that was really known for giant black crappie, and you was getting ready for say a national championship in two years from now. Would you look for a particular type of structure that we just say, all right, I know this is going to attract a lot of black crappie more than white. Does it ever get that complex? Because I know you're actually a really complex fisherman. Well, most of the lakes I fish are basically white crappie, you know. The, the black crappie, you know, it's a plus, you know. That's like on Kentucky Lake, you know, you can't catch black crappie there, but it's a plus. Uh, my home lake, Realfoot, you know, it's got some big black crappie. I know they back in the swamps and the lily pads and stuff like that. They're really hit this time of year. But, um, you know, I don't target the black crappie. Uh, I think Priest has a lot of black crappie on it, so let's let Kent answer that yeah, one. Yeah, mm -hmm. Priest is probably, you know, 65 to 70% black, black crappie. And uh, in my opinion, black crappie are much more structure oriented than white crappie. And, you know, I feel like the white crappie are more nomadic. You know, they have a tendency to roam. They have a bigger area they live in. You know, they have a tendency to suspend a lot. Um, Black crappie, you know, they just love structure. And, um, you know, for me, some of the most productive black crappie spots I have are single stake bed buckets hmm. that, like I mentioned earlier, that have about 10 to 12 stakes in them. Um, what I found is the, a lot of times your biggest crappie, that's kind of his home or his brush pile, and he won't tolerate yep. a whole lot of other crappie around him. They dominant. And yep. that's it, dominant, the dominant crappie. Yep. And you'll always catch him first for the most part. You know, when you pitch in there, um, you know, if, if, if he thinks it's, you know, it's intruding in his, his house or his yeah. home, he's he, a top dog. He, he's going to shoot back. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Uh, but yeah, the black crappie, in my opinion, are, are, are much more structure oriented. And when I go to a lake, you know, a lot of times I think of, you know, especially a new lake, 
you know, which species am I going to target? What's the biggest fish in this lake? Is it the white ones? Is it the black ones? I try to have that mindset. So, you know, when I am out there looking, I'm, I'm being real efficient. I'm not spending too much time looking at the wrong type of structure. And, uh, you know, once you catch a couple of them, you kind of, that's when you start putting the pattern together and really figuring out, you know, what is it exactly they like? We got a lot of rock in, in person hmm. priest. And during the spring, um, these fish love getting around these rocks and these big boulders, and it's because they spawn around them. And, uh, you know, that's another type of structure. I don't put it out, but I will put a brush pile next to a big boulder, you know. And there's a lot of rock, quote, rock walls, um, you know, before the lake was flooded. You know, that was just a, you know, it basically it was just big farm areas. Yeah. And, there, and there's actual fences that were made out of rock. And uh, if you talk to a lot of the locals out there, they'll tell you, you know, make sure don't don't ever skip over a rock wall on Percy Priest. Check it out for bass, crappie, everything. Well, that's a good little yeah, tip there. It, yeah, it's just it's kind of you know it's just a natural structure that's made of stone, and uh, I put a lot of stuff around a lot of these you know these, yeah. rock, these rock beds and rock piles. Um, now, when you get upriver on Priest, you start getting into the muddy areas, uh, and you get into a mud bottom, more of a mud bottom. When um, when you get you know in the upper end of the lake up there. And I, I have found that the stake beds, um, a lot of stake beds in the upper end of the lake are really, really productive for black crappie. Yeah. And that's shallower up there too. Right. So, you know, I have a tendency to fish a little bit shallower for the black crappie versus a white crappie as well. That's what I was going to think of right there. I think a black crappie probably overall stays shallower longer than white crappie. I mean, last weekend I was catching some giant black crappie in six foot of water, which is really unusual for the lake that I got on. But one of the keys that I really focused on was anything that was laying at a kind of oh, a yeah. diagonal <laughs> angle. <laughs> Absolutely. That was, yeah. you know, I don't know if you, have you ever really tried to put structure out that was sitting at that diagonal? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 The, the buckets I was talking about, a yeah. lot of my stakes are angled out like that. I mean, I'll yeah. have some standing upright and some leaning, but I have a lot of them, you know, that go out, you know, kind of like a porcupine. Yeah. And, uh, man, there's to your point there's a lot of times that's exactly where those fish get and all, from time to time i put a cross beam in there too and they love to be in like a juncture like where there's an x kind of like a tree limb on a, mm -hmm. on a on a pole timber you know you get a little beeper limb sticking off about that far man there's, for whatever reason you know it seems like those crappie love that and uh you know i've looked at them on live scope before and I've, I've said you know i swear i think he's hiding behind that little limb yeah you know, I mean, I think he's nudged up against it. And he's he got like, that one eye back he's there. He's got that one eye. Yeah, he's got that one eye or something. You know, I, <laughs> I, I'm, I've always kind of, you know, that I'm, I'm amazed at what LiveScope will tell us now that we, oh, yeah. we don't know. Yeah. And uh, it's it's it What's, really has confirmed, you know, like you're saying, some of that stuff that lays off at a funny angle can be some of your most productive absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. And I tell you, um, there's a lot of cedar in Priest, too. And those old cedar trees that, you know, that are they have a tendency to lay at an angle. And that root ball will sink, but the top of that tree will lay up like that. Man, those are some really good structures. You know, I can remember too. fishing that those ledges in in Priest there. Yeah. Sixty foot of water, and those cedars about forty foot deep. Yes. Wow. And those fish were all over me. What, fast. What, I mean, they're like what ladders. time of year was that? Man, I can't remember what time that was. It's. Uh, I bet it was winter, either winter it, or summer. It was. It was probably the. Uh, Probably late spring somewhere in there. Was it? Yeah, okay. yeah. Because yeah. most of your tournaments was during that time, but but those fish were packed at forty foot. Right, right. Yeah, that's kind of that's one of the unique things about Priest is it does have standing timber, but it's all real close to the river channel and it's all in really deep water. And uh, there's certain times of the year, especially in the winter time, man. There's there's trees that are in forty to fifty six foot to sixty foot of water, but they stick up. And there might be 15 to 20 feet below the surface. Is there? And it seems like the more limbs, the, the, bushier, the bushier they are, the more fish they hold. Yeah. Is there a particular season that you would say, all right, I need to really focus on getting my fishery better that you'd want to put structure in for? Would it be like summer, fall, winter? What time of the year would really you benefit the most as far as putting structure in a lake? Well, you know, uh, as as a general public, you know, just there's really no season that you need to do it. Just do it on your time off, you know. You know, Ronnie and I, we put structure in when it was pouring out rain, you know, cold as it could be, you know, when nobody else is on the lake, you know, because we kind of like to hide it. You know, you watch that weather report and it's going to come a big storm, rain for three or four days, I'm on the lake mm -hmm. putting out structure. Yeah, I, I agree with that. We, uh, you know, in the summer we put out the green stuff, but we'll do it late in the evening, sometimes at night. 
real yeah. early in the morning just so people aren't seeing us, you know, where we put it. You know, the, the bass fishermen love to, you know, to yeah. fish these spots too. So, we, you know, we try to hide them yeah, you know, as best we can. Yeah, then, absolutely. Other than that, in the wintertime. I, I yep. do a lot of them in the wintertime because there's just nobody on the lake that time of year. And the lake's Plus down. the lake's draw down. Yep. Yeah, I mean, typically the lake's drawn down. Yeah, and that that's a good time too. And, you know, long I've got to get a permit from the Corps of Engineers. It's no mm-hmm. big deal. You go down, you fill out a form. They send you back a letter. That's right. And you're good to go. What about artificial habitat as far as besides wood? Have you found a uh, PVC works really well for you, or does it really compare to wood? Man, I, I, the natural wood is the best you can get. Yeah, you know, I that's, agree just, with that. that's just it. You know, I, I think rough cut. Uh, you know, stakes, one inch stakes. Um, I've tried some big rough cuts. You know, some slabs. You know. I haven't had as much luck with them, um, but those one-inch stakes, man, those hardwood, oak, or hickory-type stakes. Tomato stakes. Yeah, yeah. tomato stakes yeah. or tobacco stakes. Yeah. You know, they, that's where a lot of those stakes come from is all these sawmills that, you know, that basically support the tobacco industry. And uh, But, yeah, we've um, – man, we've put out trucks of those things too. I, I remember passing them, Ronnie and Steve, mm-hmm. one time. Y'all had an eighteen wheeler full of stakes going to Pickwick. Yep, and, and had Ronnie's <laughs> no duck, denial there. Had, had Ronnie's duck boat, and I'm sure the diving gear and everything. And I said, "Man, I said, I know where they're going." We was <laughs> headed to the Wachita River with a load like that, and we had a guy that flagged us down that knew us about halfway there, had me Arkansas, like, "Hey, I'm like, oh, oh man, we busted." busted. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> well, guys, I think if you would listen to these two experts when it comes to this, put you out a little honey hole, get out there. Hey, and, and enjoy the great outdoors, what we got ahead of us. And I yep. uh, appreciate both of you guys coming on here as usual. Make sure you hit that subscribe, follow, and turn your notifications on. And, man, till next time, I'll see you guys later. And, man, we've had a great time yeah. here. Great time. Oh, man. Crappie Compound. Yeah. This place is cool. It, it? It's yeah. rocks. This is and your I, first time here, right? And my first time. Yeah. yeah. Won't I, be my last, hopefully. Yeah. I'll tell you what. Uh, Les That's what you call living the dream, man. Yeah. Les and Lois are great yep. hosts, and they, they love to. You know, have people down here, and it's kind of Les's way of honoring his dad, Mr. A. Smith. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's a great place, and we've really enjoyed coming down here. I've been coming down here honestly for almost 25 years. Oh wow. Yeah. So uh, Les and I've been great friends, and he just shares it with everybody. You know, he's got a big heart. Absolutely. And, uh, it's been a great place. So I, uh, I think you'll see, like probably in all the the beginning footage that you'll see that I shot today, you'll see how beautiful a place he has, and. Uh, it's a great place to come fishing. Sardis Lake is full of fish, so yep. I, I definitely advise you if you put it on your bucket list if you hadn't been here before. Absolutely. Yep. So, Absolutely. hey, and I appreciate what you do too, Brad, with the Crappie Connection, oh, yeah. man. Well, I've known you Can't a long do time, it. dude. Absolutely. We've known each other a long time, and I've really seen you know what you've done done over the, you know the past few years supporting the crappie industry. And I just want you to get know that you know people are they they do appreciate you. Oh yeah, yeah. I I, and, and, I agree. Uh, I, I thank yeah. them as well. Couldn't do without everybody's support. So, yeah. So folks, you know, make sure to subscribe and like and and and, and comment, man. Because Brad, yeah. the good thing about Brad is he's very open, and uh, you know, he's he's an open book, and uh, you know, he'll 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 get on a podcast and he'll talk anything that Absolutely. anything crappie related. Uh, you got a subject I, we ain't covered yet? Yeah. Tell me. You know, hit him up, man. Yeah. So uh, ain't no secrets no more. No. No, no use not, in it. No, secrets out. Really. It's yeah. Secrets out. No yeah. doubt. No doubt. Till next time, Brad Chapel here. I got Kent Driscoll, Steve Cohen. Holla. Out of my front, big muddy river, a place I'll always remember. Cabin on the lake and a fishing pole. Forever here, I'll rest my soul. I can be.